Happy Resurrection Sunday. Hope you are feeling well out there, keeping safe during these precarious times the world is going through once again. So we are Restoration Fellowship. That's the name of this ministry. This is our homepage called focusonthekingdom.org. If you'd like to know who we are, what we're all about, you can see there the link for the beliefs page or statement of faith, as some call it. And there you go. First and foremost, we hold to the non-Trinitarian creed of Jesus. Jesus was not a Trinitarian, nor was Paul, nor were any real majority of Christians until much later in history, hundreds of years later. And um, so there you have the first point. And it's the first one because Jesus said it's the first and greatest of all the commandments that the Lord God, the one God of Israel known as Jehovah or Yahweh, doesn't matter how you pronounce the divine name, by the way, our faith is not based on mysticism or sacramentalism, <clears throat> but it's a very simple Jewish Christian faith. So, all right, if you're not familiar with our ministry, so first, uh, Sir Anthony Buzzard, who's the founder of Restoration Fellowship, will open with prayer and reciting the Shema. And then we go to this morning's youth lesson from Tracy Z. You might know her from kogmissions.com. And she's got a, an, a, an announcement about her page and her ministry that she'll make this morning as well. Very excited for it. All right, so I will bring on Sir Anthony. He will open up with prayer and the reciting of the Shema. He'll let us know to those who are not familiar with the Shema what the Shema means. So good morning, Anthony. Good morning, Carlos, and thank you for that good, clear, concise introduction. Indeed, Jesus said that the superlatively great commandment is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In Hebrew, it sounds like this, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And when Jews write that, they write the first, uh, rather the last letter of the first word, Shema, it's an ayin in Hebrew, they write it large. And then the last letter of the word one, Echad, a Dalit, they write it big. They write it emphatically because these are the beginning and the end of this marvelous command. If you haven't understood this commandment, then you haven't really understood how Jesus defined God. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one person. One means one. It doesn't mean two, and it doesn't mean three. One is one. It's a cardinal number. Ask your child of two what one means, and they know. So we've come straying far from the teaching of Jesus, even at the most elementary level, that of defining who God is. So that's our point of view on that. So with that in mind, then, let us ask that one God of Israel, through the Messiah, who is at the right hand of the Father, that he would bless all of those who will pay attention to his words in the book of Hebrews. We'll be doing chapter 5, I think, and 6, probably two chapters of Hebrews today. And so we're asking a blessing on all of that. Let's pray together. Almighty God, the El Shaddai of the Old Testament and the New, the great God, the one and only God, you who alone created the heavens and the earth and all the marvelous things we see around us from your hand in nature. We thank you for giving us enough health and strength today. And above all, the miracle of the internet and those who have skills to work this marvelous miracle of the internet. We thank you for each one of them and their talents. We just pray that those who listen today, both to the lesson that uh, Tracy Zhikovic will give, also myself later on Hebrews chapter 5 and 6, that you would bless what we do, that you'd open these words that we read in Scripture to inspire, to strengthen, and to cause us to move forward towards the kingdom of God. We pray, all of us now, for the coming of your kingdom. We pray for peace on earth in a very troubled world, that you would have mercy upon the troubled world that this is, 
and bring the Messiah to rule on the earth from Jerusalem. This prayer is offered now as we do it resurrection day by resurrection day. We offer the prayer in Messiah's name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Anthony. Amen. And uh, Sir Anthony will come back later again for our reading. We're going through the book of Hebrews. If you'd like to see our previous sermons, Bible studies, just go to our youtube.com forward slash focus on the kingdom and the YouTube page and you will see it there. So, all right, we will now turn to our sister, uh, Tracy Z. And uh, first, uh, Tracy, good morning. If you could tell us a little bit about the updates to your site before uh, you go into your your youth lesson, please. Sure, Carlos. Thanks so much. Um, yes, KOG Missions does have a new web page. It's kogmissions.com forward slash life. If you could put that in and pull it up. And I greatly appreciate Barbara's contribution to help making this page and everything that she's invested in the material that's on this page. And we hope it will educate people, whether it's pastors or teachers that are instructing our youth or people just even considering an abortion about the importance of choosing life over death. And so we have a lot of information on there, articles, uh, videos, um, just a, a lot of interviews, different things to, for people to uh, get more information there. So thanks for showing that and check it out. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, that'd be great. Tracy, do you wanna advertise your other page? Uh the merchandise space? Or? Oh, not yet. Okay. No, I'm working on that though. Thanks. But we do have a missions conference coming up at the end of October and information will be coming out shortly on that as well. I don't have that out yet on the webpage at all yet. So keep looking for that. So anyways, good morning and hello, dear young people. Doesn't it make you mad that the schools teach you that you came from a monkey? They teach you the evolution theory as though it was a proven fact. And not only do they do this in science class as a specific lesson, but it's woven into all the other classes and always making reference to billions of years ago and mankind evolved and other phrases like that. And they do this as if it is all true. They must think that you're really dumb. And it's like they're trying to brainwash you to their way of thinking, not teaching you what real science shows and what we can see in the real world around us that we live in. And it really infuriates me that they think you're so stupid. Can you imagine trying to make you think that you evolved from a monkey? They don't even have any substantial proof and they have a missing link in their theory, but they still spew it everywhere as if it's true. And I know you guys are much smarter than that. The Bible tells us that God made animals, each in its own kind, and then he made humans, and God even made Eve from Adam's rib, not from a monkey's rib. And what really frustrated me when I was in those classes growing up is that you couldn't even ask questions or have a different opinion. They just wanted everybody to conform to their ideology and not ask any questions or comment of what you believed. They don't even allow you to think for yourself. And we all know that you guys are really smart and you can think for yourself. And today there is a much greater evil and many evils actually that are pervasive, not only in the schools, but in the media and everywhere else you look. Have you ever been made to feel guilty because you believe what the Bible says is true? Have you ever been made to think what your parents say is true or what the Bible says really isn't true? Or worse yet, it's evil because of what they say at your school or what you see on social media. When you listen to what is being said, do you ever wonder why they're saying what they do, because when you think about it, it just doesn't seem natural or make sense to you. It just really isn't even right. Like when someone says that, you know, if they'd say they put a pickle on their peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and instead of jelly, they use mustard. That should make you cringe just thinking about it. What if they told you that was the best way to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and then you saw your friends bringing those sandwiches for lunch, and everyone was posting pictures of themselves eating those delicious sandwiches? What if they had pictures and math books of those sandwiches and referred to them when talking about history and all the TV shows you watched had people eating them each day? Then what if they began to say, whoever says they don't like eating a peanut butter and mustard and pickle sandwich is evil or bad? 
your smart brain would say, hey, wait a minute. Just because I don't agree, that doesn't mean I'm evil. I can have a different opinion. And just because I have my own belief and my own opinion does not mean that I'm treating other people that have a different belief or opinion poorly or that I hate them. Why must I agree that a peanut butter, mustard, and pickle sandwich tastes good when I don't think it does? But if you hear about it and you see it all the time, you may soon come to like those sandwiches or at least not look at them in disgust. We are often made to think that if we don't agree with something, especially sin, that we are bad or intolerant. Have you ever heard that word at school or on TV or in the media? Intolerant? As Christians, we should be intolerant of sin just as God is. But loving, we should be towards the sinner, the people. If we are intolerant, that does not mean that we're out to call people names or be mean to anybody. If you share your opinion, and as a Christian, your opinion should be based on God's opinion, that does not mean that you hate people like they tell you it does. You can have your own opinion, just like others can have theirs. We must remember, though, that God, the creator, decides what is right and wrong and what is sinful and what is righteous, not the created ones. If you design a video game that needs a certain amount of memory and a specific video or sound card, someone can't just decide that they don't want to use those specific cards or that amount of memory. Well, of course, they can think that and uh, maybe they can try not using it, but the game isn't going to work for them if they don't follow the instructions. If I gave you a recipe for a cake and you decided you were going to use glue instead of milk and sawdust instead of flour, your cake would not turn out as it should, and it certainly wouldn't taste very good. God, our Heavenly Father, is the potter. We are the clay. He designed each plant, each animal, and human beings with its own blueprint and its own design. God made your body so intricately. He designed each cell with a purpose and a function. The Bible tells us that uh, you are wonderfully made. And God even knew you before he created you inside of your mother. And by the way, that's not inside of your father because he doesn't have a uterus. God didn't make him with one. And when DNA came together to make you, it was at that moment it determined what your eye color and hair would be. And if you were a boy or a girl. Simply, simple biology, science that is, tells us that who we are physically a boy or a girl, tall or short, red or brown hair. But God gave us brains and free will to use to decide what we like doing and eating or what colors we like best and what we enjoy. When I was growing up, I was what many may call a tomboy. But why must we be labeled like that? I was just a girl who enjoyed hunting, fishing, climbing trees and sports. I was strong and fast. Now my sister, on the other hand, liked playing the piano and wore makeup and she wasn't very strong or fast. But we were both girls and we're now both women. I didn't need a sex change to do what I enjoyed doing. What we enjoy doing or how we look or dress does not determine our gender or sex. I had short hair and I looked like a boy most of my school years because my mom cut my hair when I was five because I wouldn't let her brush the snarls out and she got sick of it. But just because I looked like a boy didn't mean I thought I was really a boy inside. I didn't need to call myself he or him because I played on a boys soccer team or wanted to excel in something girls typically didn't do back then. If all of today's propaganda was back when I was growing up, I am sure I could have been easily persuaded to think that I was in the wrong body. Going through puberty is tough on everyone, as you guys know, back then and today. But people have done it for 6,000 years. And this new thinking has not just come from the minds of toddlers or preteens or even teenagers. It's been introduced by therapists, by culture, teachers, TV, and social media. I was teased in elementary school because I was fat and I wasn't one of the cute girls that the popular boys liked. But I never once thought I had a gender identity problem. I just thought I was fat and ugly and I had to deal with it. Unfortunately, most children deal with some sort of psychological pain, even us adults do. But all people really want is affection and attention and they want to be accepted and fit in. 
I didn't feel comfortable in my fat body, and I don't now today either, but it didn't get better for me back then, even after going through puberty as a girl, especially when I was competing in sports. Many people, kids and adults alike, feel like they don't fit in or they don't like their bodies. Seeking answers with gender is not the answer to fitting in or feeling accepted. Changing personal pronouns or body parts is not the solution and it won't make things better. When we feel certain ways, we should try to find out the real why, reason why we're feeling sad or hurt or frustrated. And we may have to change things that we're going, that we're doing, or we may have to accept outside circumstances. Like I wasn't the prettiest girl and I was a little overweight, but I could work on those things. And if I knew who I was in Christ, he loved me. God loves me no matter what I look like. And only Jesus can bring us comfort and true peace and lasting happen happiness, even when bad feelings and are around or for suffering. As Christian children, you should be compassionate towards others who do not know Jesus and understand this, that you should be kind to them, even if they're seeking acceptance or satisfaction in other places, especially sexually or in today's false idea of gender. You should never tease them or make fun of them, but you should also Know that you do not need to accept homosexuality or transgender lifestyles as godly options for life. Inclusion is including a person in a game or conversation. It wants men, including the shy girl or boy, and inviting them to come play too. It has nothing to do with accepting or condoning a worldview or lifestyle. The Bible is clear that God does not approve of these lifestyles that are being pushed on you today. But it is also clear that he loves the people just as he loves you. If you can show people love and acceptance uh, of them and not their beliefs or worldviews, of course, maybe they will seek reconciliation with their Heavenly Father who can give them what they are looking for. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. There is no alternative if you want true peace and love today and hope for life in the kingdom when Jesus returns. So my dear children, you must guard your hearts and your minds. What they're teaching you in school and what you see on social media is not real and it is not true. You need to seek truth in the Bible. So God bless and have a good day. All right. Thank you, Tracy, for that much needed reminder. And uh, we are planning something next month with Tracy and others. So prayers for that uh, related to this very important topic, what I called an identity crisis in the world, if not in our so-called churches or with self-professed Christians. There's a deep identity crisis at the moment, and there's a deep uh, agenda being uh, taught out there to our children and our youth. So thank you so much, Tracy, for uh, always being courageous to talk about these issues. And kogmissions.com, and check out her website, a lot of information there, a lot, lots of good links. And look uh, forward to the October Missions Conference. So she'll post that soon enough. <clears throat> All right. So before we go to Sir Anthony and uh, our continuing reading of Hebrews, let me do a quick reminder of... Um, and another issue that some of us uh, feel strongly about, and it has to do with the church. Okay, hopefully that can be seen. Just give me a minute. All right, uh, let me try that again. So, okay. Let's see if this works. So, folks, is this PowerPoint that suddenly the PowerPoint on the StreamYard I have problems with. So, all right, as you can see there on the screen, problems with the pastor church model. So what are those problems? 
It's not biblical. The fact that there is one person preaching to you every Sunday is not biblical. It's not in the Bible. You won't find that, and I will show you. The problem with this one pastor plan or rule that has been implemented for millennia now is that it does it does not make the pastor accountable to others. So there is no, uh, uh, as we will see, people overseeing what the pastor is teaching or doing. So it forms an autocracy. That is self-rule because there are no other overseers. By the way, in the Bible, the word translated overseer is also means pastor, also means a bishop, a presbyter. So it's all from that same word. And it really is about the same office in the church. More problems, church passivity, that is non-action on the part of congregants, of church members. You know the old saying, you check your brain at the door because people are just sitting there week in, week out, Sunday in, Sunday out, listening to one individual. And that one individual, that pastor, will eventually burn out. We have seen it. Uh, I have seen it in my life with other pastors where they're just not being helped. There is no uh, sense of uh, team or, or teamwork, so they quickly burn out. And obviously, there's no church edification. That is, no one... Per no one person has all the gifts, skills, and abilities that the congregation needs. You know, someone once said that the problem with, the, with churches are the people. <laughs> so, uh, you know, people need different things. And as your church group grows, as your membership grows, you will have more, more issues, more problems. So the one person cannot obviously, obviously meet all those different personalities and the problems they bring every Sunday morning. Now, the Bible does talk about pastors in the plural. It is biblical. Again, the word is presbyterios in the plural. Ten plus times it appears throughout uh, the New Testament. It's used in the singular once, as far as I know, in 1 Timothy 5.19, and it has to do with accusations against an elder or a presbyter that requires two or three witnesses. So I found this fascinating that the one singular use of the word translated pastor, bishop, overseer, whatever, has to do with uh, the church holding them accountable to uh, some malpractice or, or bad action or bad teaching, perhaps, that is going on, uh, that the field church is going on. So isn't that interesting? It creates a democracy, the right kind of democracy, by the way. We know that the world has, you know, perverted many words. But democracy, there is a good positive sense to it, and that is there are group decisions. You are sharing different gifts with your fellow pastors. There is obvious accountability, Proverbs 15, 22. Without advisors, they succeed. I'm uh, sorry, without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, your plans will succeed. This is biblical, and it's really common sense. You don't really need to be a Christian, by the way, to understand that there is wisdom in seeking advice with others you know the old saying no man is a and no man is an island or you know no person is an island so now some time ago i created a one of my first ever videos and i checked the date as you can see the, this is a screen capture from our youtube channel 10 years ago now and unfortunately it's a little scene video, only 257 views in 10 years, perhaps people can't find it. Or, But I, I did this quick video, which I'd like to close with this morning, 
And just to show you the gravity of, of, of this issue. And uh, here it is. Thank you. from the shoulder where I stand. Jones said he stood for social and economic equality, a utopian society. He was politically active and something of a local celebrity. But after some negative publicity, Jones moved his church and his followers to Guyana. This is March 19, 1997, and <clears throat> I'm Doe, uh, some called our partnership T and Doe. That's not my name, but that's how I'm referred to on planet Earth. Let me say that our mission here at this time is about to come to a close in the next few days. All right, so that is the problem that happens. Uh, Jesus famously said that we make null the, uh, the commandments of God by our traditions, didn't he? So, okay, I hope, uh, sorry, I'm just having problems with my camera here. All right, we will go to Sir Anthony. We will continue with... Uh, let's see, did that fix itself? Nope. Oh, I don't know why I'm blurry, but uh, oh, I'm disappearing. Okay, so, all right. Um, 
Now you can follow along the reading here from Sir Anthony on his uh, translation slash commentary, the one God, the father, one man, Messiah translation. You don't have to, by the way, <laughs> I just did a thing on pastors right in. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, let's see, we are in Hebrew. So one God translation.com. Thank you to Lori out there for her work, dedication. And I believe we are in chapter five and take it away, Anthony, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and you're absolutely right to stress that no single individual can be an apostle at the level of the 12 these days. To be an apostle in the New Testament setting, you must have seen the risen Jesus and none of you has. You've got a, a relationship with Jesus, yes, but you haven't seen him alive. You haven't eaten and drunk with him after he came back from death. That's what the apostles in the Bible did. That was the qualification which made them apostles. They actually had seen the resurrected Jesus and had meals with him, and you haven't. The other point would be that you haven't got the accrediting signs and wonders of an apostle. You haven't laid hands on the sick and brought them out of wheelchairs on a regular basis. You haven't raised the dead. The apostles did that. I refer to you to a verse, I refer you to a verse in Hebrews we already read in earlier chapters, which says that God spoke finally through his son. So the major lesson in the book of Hebrews is this. That if you want to know what the gospel is, if you want to know what the truth is about God and about his great plan for mankind, then you must listen to the words and the teachings of Jesus. And alas, you may not have been taught that. You've been taught in all likelihood, if you're living in America, that you are to believe that Jesus died for you and rose. That's absolutely essential. That's only half the gospel. If you'll pick up a tract, there are thousands of them all over the internet on how to be saved. You read there that Jesus died for your sins and forgave you. That's fine, but it's not the beginning of the gospel. So we make the point here at Restoration Fellowship that if you want to understand Jesus and the gospel and salvation, you must listen firstly to the teachings, the gospel of the kingdom teachings of Jesus. That's why when you show your friends the gospel, you start with Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Guess what that says? The beginning of the gospel. You don't begin with the death of Jesus. That's also very important, but it's not the beginning. First, you must understand the gospel of the kingdom, and then you must realize that you've been forgiven because of the death of Jesus. That's essential, but the gospel is two parts, the kingdom and the death of Jesus. In all likelihood, you've not been taught that the gospel is firstly about the kingdom. So with that in mind, that gives us a good background to the book of Hebrews, where we read in an earlier chapter that the gospel, if you want to know what that is, began, had its beginning with the words of Jesus. You'll find that in chapter two. We've done it already, but I'm repeating it in light of what uh, Carlos was saying. We must insist on the beginning of the gospel as being the beginning of the teaching of Jesus. And that's what Hebrews 2 verse 4 says. And then that beginning, the kingdom of God, the words of Jesus, that gets you started on the proper foundation. So we're now in chapter 5. We've been working our way through chapters for several weeks. And this is not really a letter, this book of Hebrews. It's more like a treatise. It's an extended sermon, teaching, if you like. And in chapter 5, we begin with this, every high priest taken from among men. Would you please note that to be a priest or a high priest, you have to be selected from among men because you're representing men before God. That would tell you immediately, if you're thinking at all, that Jesus could not be God. He has to be a man in order to be a priest or a high priest. It's impossible for a priest to be chosen from God. That's just nonsense. He's chosen from among men. So there's your proof, one of 
thousands of proofs that Jesus is the human Messiah. In fact, the book of Hebrews has already called him an apostle and high priest. That's the theme that the writer to the Hebrews started talking about in earlier chapters. Now he comes back to it in chapter 5, 1, and speaks about the high priest who has to be selected from among human beings. Jesus is the perfect, sinless human being. And he's selected then from among men to deal with things pertaining to God. That's an interesting phrase, proston theon, things that concern God. Same phrase exactly in John 1.1. 1, 1. The word had to do with God, concerned God. And here Jesus is the high priest dealing with all the God things in our life. <coughs> so, I want to point out to you that this is a very comforting although very stern and strict chapter. The whole book is a series of warnings as well as a series of encouragements. But here's something very comforting to think about in 5.2. A high priest has to offer gifts and sacrifices. That's what priests do. So what could Jesus offer? Did he go around offering sacrifices? For you know. <coughs> Excuse me, but he gave himself as a sacrifice. That's absolutely clear. He gave himself as a sacrifice. And in verse 4, you find that no one takes the honor of being a priest to himself. It's an honor indeed to be a priest, to be standing in the place of of God, if you like, representing God before the one God. So nobody takes that honor. Please note the word honor there in verse 4. But he receives it when he's called by God. So if you are a Christian, I want to tell you, you also are a priest. I wonder if you knew that. In First Peter 2, 9, we have a list of what we Christians are. We are a holy nation international, true people of God. We are priests and kings, royalty, and also priests. We're not high priests. Only one can be the high priest. And that, of course, is Jesus himself. But nobody takes that honor of being a priest or a high priest, but he receives it from God, just as Aaron. Aaron was the first high priest, working alongside Moses, of course. In verse 5 of Hebrews 5, also Messiah, and when you read the word Christ in the Bible, you should always substitute the word Messiah because that gives it its Jewish flavor. Christ is not just a family name like John Smith, Jesus Christ. You know, somebody said humorously, many people think that Christ is a family name. So then on that understanding or that misunderstanding, Jesus would be the son of Mary and Joseph Christ. No, 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 no. Christ is a royal title. It's the title of a high priest and the king of the coming kingdom. So Messiah, I'm reading in verse 5 of Hebrews 5, also Messiah did not glorify himself in order to become a high priest, but he who said to him, and I quote from the Old Testament, you remember in chapter 1, he had no less than seven quotations from the Old Testament to describe who Jesus is. And here it comes back to that same practice of, of citing Old Testament verses. And he loves this one. You are my son. Today I've begotten you. You find that in Psalm 2, verse 7. You, God speaking to his son, said, are my son. Today I've become your father. I like that better. To beget is a foggy word in modern English. We don't talk about begetting children normally. But I've become your father. If Jesus became the son of the father, that means he wasn't always that son. You can't 
become the sun if you already are the sun. So the story in Matthew and Mark and Luke is clearly that Jesus was created, procreated, if you like, begotten, fathered in the womb of his mother Mary. The best verse on that would be Matthew one twenty for your notes, where it says that the one who was begotten, that means brought into existence, that's what the beget, word beget means, was from the Holy Spirit. Matthew one twenty mistranslated in your translations as conceived. Yes, it was a conception, but what Matthew is describing in Matthew one twenty is the bringing into existence of the sun. So I hope we've got that clear. There's only one person in the universe who is uncreated, eternal. There's no such person in the Bible as the eternal son of God. That's just nonsense. A son by definition who is begotten has a beginning of existence and that beginning was said to be today. Today I have begotten you. Note that then in Hebrews 5, fine. You are my son, God defining his own son here. Today, I, God, have become your father. That puts an end immediately to the idea of an eternal son. So the church fathers, so-called, and Carlos was right to point out that even when you have a multitude of pastors, they can all be wrong together. And the church fathers were very muddled about that word today. When they read, Today, I become your father. That really was embarrassing because by that time they thought that Jesus was eternally the Son of God. So, what are they going to do? Well, they simply said, the word today doesn't mean today. When God uses the word today, he means eternity. This is the sort of hopeless confusion and nonsense into which much theology has fallen. And our attempt, and it will be yours too, I hope, is to get back to the simple truths of the Bible. Today, I, God, have become father of Jesus. What was that day? He became the father of Jesus, God did, in the womb of his mother, Jesus' mother, Mary, by miracle. No need to fuss over that. It's nothing to do with God having sex. God, by miracle, effected, brought about, a perfect creation of a new son, a second Adam, whom he then appointed also as high priest. And that's what we're reading about here. Just as he said in another passage, look how this author can pull in the Old Testament. He knows it so well. So in verse 6, just as he says in verse 6 of Hebrews 5, he says in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the rank or order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is introduced now, and he's a mysterious figure who appears in Genesis out of nothing. In fact, in Hebrews it says, there's no genealogical record of who Melchizedek was. It actually says he has no father and mother. That doesn't mean that he was God, of course not. That is a Hebraic, very Jewish way of saying there's no record of the genealogy of Melchizedek. Well, guess what? Jews said there was no record of Sarah, that's the wife of Abraham, that she had no genealogical record. She had no father and mother. doesn't mean that Sarah was born miraculously. Of course not. It's a Hebraic way of saying there's no genealogical record of who Melchizedek was, but he was a very high, highly important person because Abraham even paid tithes to Melchizedek. How vastly significant and important then was Melchizedek? Well, Jesus is of that class of high priest, not just your average high priest, not just your average priest, but a Melchizedekian priest who is a supremely important person that Melchizedek in the Old Testament was a type, a picture, an impression, not the real thing, but a copy of the eventual high priest Melchizedek, who is Jesus. There it says then in verse 6, in another passage, 
you're a priest forever according to the all the order the rank the type of melchizedek so jesus is both son of god and he's a supreme high priest chosen from among men and therefore could not possibly be god then in verse 7 i love this phrase here in the days of his flesh the days of his flesh means the time when jesus was here on the earth teaching and preaching the days of his flesh he's no longer in the days of his flesh because he died and was resurrected and then taken where he is now to the right hand of the father in heaven that's where jesus is now but there was a time in history in the first century when he had the days of his human life the devil hates anything to do with the days of jesus human life the devil does not want you to know what Jesus taught. He's very happy for you to understand that Jesus died for your sins. That's fine. But he doesn't want you to know the teachings of Jesus. So one of our major themes that we come back to over and over again is this from 1 Timothy 2.5. In your notes, take a note of 1 Timothy 2.5. says, if somebody comes to you now and doesn't bring the teachings of Jesus, watch out, you're being scammed. So you might write to one of the thousands of sites on the internet offering salvation, and I can almost certainly guarantee you they won't mention anything about the gospel of the kingdom. So you write to them very gently and respectfully and say, wait a minute, when Jesus preached, when he taught, Mark 1.1, Mark 1 14, he always preached about the kingdom of God and he said, repent and believe in that gospel of the kingdom. Why don't you start there? They don't. So there's something that is awry, something is amiss, something is strangely out of whack, out of order in the teaching of the gospel in America today. I'll just quote you Billy Graham, nothing against Billy Graham. God is his judge, not me. But Billy Graham says, that Jesus came to do three days work. Uh-oh, to die, to be buried, to rise. That's false. Jesus did not come to do three days work. He came to do three and a half years of work preaching the gospel, Luke 4.43. So that's an important thesis for us all to get hold of. There in verse 7 then, in the days of his flesh, his earthly life, there it is in my translation, his life on earth, Here's what Jesus did. This is very comforting for us. He offered up prayers and requests, even with loud crying and tears. Even Jesus then cried out to God with tears and strong requests to the one, that's God the Father, who was able to save him from death. Did God save him from death? Actually, no. Did Jesus then fail? Did he give up because God didn't answer that prayer? Of course not. Here's what it says. God heard the prayer of Jesus because of the godly fear of Jesus. God had such respect for his son because of his obedient attitude. Because although he was a son, this is Jesus in verse 8, he learned obedience now you surely know that god cannot ob learn obedience that would absolutely tell you that jesus couldn't be god no he was the son of god but he learned through his suffering through the events of his very difficult life he learned to obey god even to the point of death remember jesus said not my will but your will be done he said let this cup of death and suffering pass from me. But if it is your will that I have to suffer to the point of death, then let that be so. That was a successful model that Jesus presents then for all of us in verse 9. Having been perfected, this is Jesus, he became to all of those who obey him the source of eternal salvation which i translate i think correctly as the salvation about the age to come the future kingdom 
That Hebrews 5, 9 is a refrigerator verse for all of us. Jesus became to all of those who obey him the source of salvation. Then guess what? If you don't obey Jesus, you're not going to be saved. Salvation depends on obedience, that key word, obeying Jesus. And that word salvation had been mentioned earlier in Hebrews. What if we were to actually neglect so great a salvation? I'm referring back to chapter 2 to remind you, which was first preached by Jesus. Please understand this. Salvation was not first demonstrated by the death of Jesus. That came later. That was essential. Salvation begins with the words of Jesus because God spoke finally through a son. God spoke through a son. So here's the falsehood. You've been taught that well, Jesus died for you, so that's all you need. No, no, that's not right. You certainly need the death of Jesus who died in your place, his substitutionary atonement, as we call it. But you first need the foundation of all that, which is the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. So you begin with Mark 1 and Mark 1, 14 and 15. Your friends will be shocked to hear that's the beginning of the gospel because they've probably in all likelihood been taught that the objective of their faith is to go to heaven when they die. Nothing could be more false than that. Not a word in the Bible says anything about going to heaven as a disembodied soul when you die. That is pure and rank paganism. So come away from that idea and learn that the objective of your Christian life is to inherit the kingdom of God to inherit salvation. Salvation is a hope mainly in the Bible. Yes, it begins now. You've got to get a hold of the idea of salvation, but it's largely and mainly a hope. Certainly not going to heaven when you die. Certainly inheriting the earth. We surely know that Jesus said, blessed are the meek. He's going to inherit the earth. Keep that in mind. Okay, in verse 10 then, being designated by God, speaking of Jesus again, as a high priest, there, this is the theme returning again, he's a high priest according to the rank or type of this king of Tzedek, king of righteousness, who was typified in the Old Testament and fully then realized in Jesus himself. Now look at 11. I want to warn you, this book of Hebrews is pretty tough. It's fairly disparaging, you might almost say, about those to whom he's writing. Concerning Jesus of the order of Melchizedek, we have a lot of things to say, he says in verse 11. But it's hard to explain this to you since you've become so dull of hearing. So you say to yourself now as a listener this morning, could I be in that category? Am I dull of hearing? Am I getting these truths clear? Or am I in a big fog? And if you find yourself then at a loss to answer confidently, then you begin to pray consistently. I've always been puzzled in a way by Paul's phrase, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? You obviously can't pray literally without ceasing. You have to talk to other people. But you'd better be in a state of constant prayer to God. First thing in the morning, last thing at night on and off during the day, in a concentrated prayer. In this case, oh God, if I am blind and not seeing clearly, send some kind person to help me to understand. That's what this writer would have said to you. You ought to be teachers, he says in verse 12. Well, you can answer me here by saying, James actually says, don't be too many of you teachers because you're going to be more highly responsible for getting it right. But in a sense, then, every Christian has to be a teacher at some level. You know, not always all of you are going to be ordained officially as elder or pastor in the group or a series of elders and pastors in the group. That's not for everybody. But you'd better be ready to teach at some level, according to this text here. You ought to be teachers at some level. 
But you need, and he's being pretty tough on his audience here, you need someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. What are the oracles of God? In your notes there, you put Romans 3, 2, says the Jews, the Jewish people, in Romans 3, 2, were highly, highly privileged because God gave to them, entrusted to the Jewish people, the oracles of God. I would think that's a very high privilege. When God speaks, nothing else matters. The only thing that makes any ultimate sense in life is that we listen to what God says. There's a great deal of confusion about salvation by grace and by works and all that. Much of that discussion is really not necessary, certainly not as complex as it's become. Salvation is by obedience. You had it there in Hebrews 5, 9. Salvation, and what salvation? The gift of immortality in the future, causing you to live forever and ever and ever and ever, causing you to rule the world with Jesus. That salvation is given to those who obey Jesus. End of story. It's not given to those who disobey Jesus. So Hebrews 5.9 is a very wonderful proof text of the best type. Then you ought to be teachers, he complains in verse 12, but you need the elementary teachings. <clears throat> My sense is that people do not know <clears throat> God's timetable very well. They don't understand that the law of Moses is finished. You are now under the Torah of Messiah. There are two different covenants in the Bible. The covenant made with Moses, that's not for you. And the covenant made with Jesus. So what is the covenant made with Jesus? The answer is the kingdom of God covenant. You perhaps didn't know that in Luke 22, 29, Jesus said, I covenant <clears throat> to give you the kingdom. There's the covenant of the new covenant, the gift of the kingdom. Some in our circle of friends are trying to mix the old covenant with the new. That is a fatal mistake. It is quite false to say that you must mix Mosaic law with the law of Messiah. These are two different Torahs, and you are to strive to obey the Torah of Messiah not the Torah of Moses. That's a very important lesson. Everyone who partakes of milk, he says in verse 13, is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. The word is very often the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, not vaguely the Bible. You aren't really very good in your Bible study, this writer says, if all you get is milk all the time and not the deeper teachings. But in verse 14, solid food, this is likening your Bible study and your Bible reading, your Bible understanding to food, you feed on it, is for the mature who, because of practice, have been trained to know the difference between good and evil. You remember that was the problem in Genesis. They did, in fact, learn the difference between good and evil. But they hadn't at that stage had the training to know how to be strong enough to do the good and reject the evil. So God kicked them out of the garden. He didn't want them taking the tree of the life of the age to come, eternity, immortal life in that tree. He didn't want them getting it then when they hadn't been trained. So your point as a Christian is you're being trained and you'd better get on with the business of being trained and learning the difference between good and evil. There it is. That's a very clear lesson. This teacher in the book of Hebrews, whoever it was, could have been Apollos. I don't think it was Paul, but we'll find out in the resurrection who this was, was very tough on his students. He really accused them in the best sense, warned them in the best sense of being blind and not being teachers as they should be. So he moves on then logically and inexorably in chapter 6. I think we have time 
to do something with Shadow um, 6. Before we go then? Yep. Go uh, ahead. Just a couple of things. So, yep. yeah, this is quite a striking passage here. Mm. Uh, it was five. Let me ask you uh, about his office of high priest. Yeah. So we see there the uh, writer using Psalm 110. Absolutely. Very important. Now, if we look at the Septuagint, the Greek translation, yep. I'll just use this online one, which mm -hmm. says pretty much makes the point uh, that I want to bring up. Yep. <clears throat> so it's a notorious. Uh, verse 3 is notorious for there being some kind of uh, Hebrew corruption in the Masoretic text. We're not quite sure what happened, but the vowel points read very differently. And it's not clear in the Hebrew, but in the Greek translation, we find what sounds like a reference to the virgin birth before the morning star I brought you forth or other translations have, I have begotten you. Yep. And then it uses that verse 4 from uh, Hebrews 5. The Lord has sworn, sworn will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. Is it right to say that he's also a high priest according to his begetting? Absolutely. He's a high priest from the moment he begins to exist. Today I've begotten you, I brought you into existence, and today he's been appointed, as he was, as high priest, absolutely. It doesn't matter whether you read the Hebrew or the Greek, there's truth in both of them, but the church fathers rightly, I think, referred to the virgin birth there, if you put that translation back a moment. With you was the beginning in the day of your power, in the brightness of the holies. That's a, not a very nice translation out of the belly before the morning star from the belly of your mother before the morning star that would be before the dawn of the future kingdom i have begotten you and that happened then by the miraculous conceiving of jesus begetting i should say matthew 120 which yeah. happened in the womb of my you of have the Mary. greek there on the left yeah i don't know if you can read it for us absolutely well, there it is, the Greek, you have that very word, I have brought you forth, I have begotten you, is correct. Right. So, uh, yes. so it's not wrong to um, assume, mm. or is it as a, an assumption, that he's high priest from the womb, yes. just as he is the son of God from the womb? Is that absolutely. a fair assessment? Of course, of absolutely, that's who he is. There's no need to fuss over that at all. So God then appointed him by a begetting, by a divine miraculous begetting in the womb of his mother. And the church fathers took the Septuagint there to be a reference to the virgin birth in the Old Testament. And I think rightly, that's fine. It's absolutely true that Jesus is the high priest from the moment he begins to exist in the womb of his mother. You have to do that to be human. If you do not begin to exist in the womb of your mother, you are not, not human. You're something else. And you don't want to muddle in a human Jesus, the true, genuinely human Jesus, with somebody who really couldn't be human because he didn't have the, his origin, as all humans must, in the womb of his mother. Now, if we're yeah. right, and yeah. he is high priest from the womb, yes, just as he is the son of God from the womb, mm -hmm. then that would obviously mean that during his life, during his ministry, yeah. he was doing uh, things that a high priest would do, like Absolutely. forgive sins of course, and things like that. Cleansing, uh, yes. healings were also uh, in, an interpretive way of cleansing people in, yeah. in that Jewish mindset, as you know. Yes. So if a leper was healed, it, it also meant he was cleansed. He was forgiven mm. of his sins. So it looks to me like Jesus is already functioning as Absolutely. a figure on earth. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing yeah. this is because some 
yeah. uh, think that Jesus only becomes high priest at his yeah. ascension. Yeah. And they use passages like this one in uh, Hebrews 8. Since every high priest is appointed to offer both gift sacrifices, it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. And the chapter is about how when he w was taken up, he transversed, entered this sort of heavenly temple, this heavenly sanctuary, and now he's functioning truly as the high priest. And then it says on verse eight, uh, four, sorry, as you see there, if Jesus were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offered the gifts prescribed by the law. So recently I came upon a, in a debate, yes. the interpretation that, oh, this means that he was not a priest on earth. Yeah. He's only functioning as a priest now. What would you say? Well, to I would answer that very easily. And here's a very good verse to remember, 9.11 of Hebrews. If you could put that up for us on the screen there, possibly. Hebrews 9.11 what does it say about the high priesthood of Jesus? Hebrews 9, 11. When Christ came, when he showed up as high priest of the good things that are coming or already here, both versions are possible. He then later went through the greater, more perfect tabernacle. That's to say, not something of this creation. But he showed up as high priest. So. It's very dangerous to say that Jesus was not acting as the high priest while on earth. He was. He showed up as high priest. Somebody wrote the other day that when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And the writer said, well, he couldn't be born again till Pentecost. That's false. Any teaching which negates, which flattens, which gets rid of, which wipes out the teachings of the historical Jesus is Antichrist. I remind you of 1 Timothy 2, uh, 6, 3 again. If anybody comes to you and doesn't bring the teaching, the teaching, the teaching of Jesus, which had its beginning in the ministry of Jesus, the book of Hebrews says, its beginning, Mark 1 says, the beginning of the gospel, any teaching which tries to soften or get rid of Jesus' teaching is Antichrist. So I would say that Hebrews 9.11 is absolute proof that he is acting as the high priest. He was not of right. the order of <laughs> Levi, however. He, he couldn't function as right. a priest so like this, Levi. Yeah. Sorry, so this verse, Anthony, here yeah. could be interpreted to mean that also, I mean, the way I, re I read this verse mm. on, on a first reading mm. is still the way I'm understanding it now. Yeah. Because sometimes when you read for, uh, things on a first basis, then you might change your mm -hmm. idea or interpretation. But mm -hmm. I still hear this verse as saying that if Jesus were on earth, mm -hmm. he's disqualified to be a priest according to the law of Moses. Of course. That's how I'm reading it as well. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yes. Because the priests on earth offer gifts prescribed by the law. That is the right. law of Moses. Yeah. But because we're making the point, which is the broader, more important point, mm -hmm. that Jesus and his followers are in a way exempt from the law, what's known the Torah of, of Moses. Yes. By the way, obviously we know that Moses did not create the law. I just have to make this little discla right. <laughs> disclaimer. Obviously, God gave Moses the law, so it's God's law, but it's called 20 plus times the law of Moses. Just a little disclaimer for uh, op opponents out there. Yep. But uh, you see what I'm, I'm saying here? So if he's on earth, he's obviously not qualified according to that old covenant law of Moses. That's what right. do you think of that? Well, it's absolutely clear because guess what? Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi. And so he's disqualified as a mosaic priest. That's what's being said there. He couldn't function as a Levitical priest on earth because he wasn't from that tribe. The writer goes on to say, we know that Jesus was descended from Jews, Judah. And the writer even says, we know that no priest 
of the Levitical type could be descended from Judah to be disqualified. So the point is simply that Jesus, since he wasn't a Levite, but since he was a Melchizedekian priest of different order, could not function on earth as a priest. And yet he was a Melchizedekian priest during his ministry. That's Hebrews 9.11. He showed up. And as you rightly said, he did all kinds of priestly things, didn't he? He cleansed the lepers. He forgave sins. He functions as a, as a, a priest of the Melchizedekian type, which is not the same as the Levitical priest. So well, that, I think, would answer that point. Yeah, the way the way you put it was interesting. So he's not a mosaic no. high priest. No. He is a Melchizedekian high priest. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you this about this uh, yeah. so-called mysterious figure. Yeah. Because, you know, there's this whole thing that has developed with this person known as Melchizedek because it says, you know, we don't have his family tree. Right. But also because of other verses... And then in Hebrews 7, I know we're going ahead a little bit, but right. I think it's within the same Absolutely. topic. Absolutely, yep. In Hebrews 7, uh, it says that, he, so he's brought back again by the writer mm -hmm. to make a point, um, yep. uh, to make, because Melchizedek is what we call a type of the one to come, right? Right, an impression of, not the right. real thing, but an impression of, yes. Now, let me get your answer to the reading here which mm. some translate that he had no beginning or end of right. life or to his life what what does that mean to you well it says just before that he had no father or mother without genealogy without beginning of days that's to say without recorded beginning of days and and and, and years sarah the jews said had no genealogy Sarah had no mother and father. Doesn't mean she didn't have a mother and father. We know that. It meant there was no record. So it simply states here that this high priest of which Jesus then was the antitype or the fulfillment, that high priest had no recorded father or mother. So he's like the son of God. And he remains then a priest forever. Jesus is like the son of God of God, sorry. Jesus is like the Melchizedekian priest. And Melchizedek was like the Son of God without being the Son of God. That's quite clear. It's a little subtle, but this is a profoundly uh, deep book. It requires great study. You need to get hold of a good commentary, maybe Jameson, Fawcett and Brown, or the Tyndale commentary series, and really work at this. This Bible is not just a joke, it's far enough far from being a joke. It right. absolutely requires study and meditation. One more question before we yeah. go to chapter six, yeah. Anthony. Yes. Uh, our friend Matt Sacra. Yes. Does the view Jesus became high priest at his baptism have any merit or possibility in your view? Well, I don't think it's right because it says he showed up. He showed up in 9-11. He didn't show up at his baptism. All of the texts in Galatians speak of until faith came, until Christ came. The law of Moses was valid until Christ came. And so it's not just at his baptism. Granted that Jesus didn't do most of his teaching at all before his baptism. So you could, you could argue his baptism is the time when his public ministry begins. So I, I wouldn't quibble over that. It doesn't matter. Jesus, of course, did do some teaching even at a 12 year old as a 12 year old so i don't think that matters at all it's it's not really significant what is significant is that he was high priest before he died and before he rose again the moment he started teaching whether you say that was when he was 12 or later when he was 30 he's functioning as a high priest because today i've begotten you refers to his beginning in the womb of his mother. That's the way I would look at that. But it's a good, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, the, let's see, the verse here, Anthony, mm. Hebrews 9, 11, it has that begetting word or coming into existence word, yenomenon. No, not, not the same word. 
Okay. Now, it's a single end then. Having come, let's just say, Christ, however, having appeared, there it is, having showed up, that parayenome. Parayenome. Okay. Yes, parayenome is the verb. Parayenomenos. He showed up, appeared on the scene as high priest of the good things to come. There's a variation. Is it good things to come or things which have come? It really doesn't matter. He was the high priest of the kingdom of God. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. The covenant of the kingdom was his whole business. And then he showed up as high priest. From the moment he opened his mouth as a teacher, he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So yenomenon there with a single N is not quite the same as yenao with a double N. Slight difference. Right. And the parayenomenos word yes. is yes. arrived at the scene. Yes. Uh, Good. So that it's it's very hard to read into that a later time. Is yes. That what you're saying? That's that's what I'm suggesting. He showed up. He appeared, and Christ came in Galatians, which is a good parallel. Moses was until Christ came, but now that faith has come, Paul said in Galatians, as to say, now that Jesus has come and taught, then we don't need the law of Moses. So if you're going to insist on Sabbath keeping calendar holy days you're simply saying i don't think jesus is adequate i need moses to help me out you don't that would to take me to take yourself away from the blessings of believing jesus and believing his teaching don't want to mix moses with jesus that would be a dangerous thing life and death matter according to the book of galatians uh, uh sorry anthony one yeah. more question yeah. uh, where in genesis is it written that Sarah has no genealogy? No, it doesn't say that, but it does in the New, doesn't it? Uh, oh, where, sorry, it, where in Genesis? No, it's in Jewish writings. Oh, in Jewish writings. Yes, extra sorry, extra Jewish biblical Jewish. writings. Extra biblical writings. Right. It says that it, Sarah had no mother and father. What they meant was that she had no recorded genealogy yeah, right. and Melchizedek is the same. Right, no, no proper uh, family tree, if you That's will. That's right. Um, That's right. So we have another comment here. Isn't yep. Sarah the daughter of Terah, since she was Abraham's half-sister? Yes. Yes, yes, that's right. And actually, my wife is telling me that that uh, source, a source for that story yep. that Sarah had no yep. family tree, mm -hmm. is uh, also told to us by Philo. Good. The uh, Greek yep. uh, philosopher. So. Well, he was a Greek philosopher, very Jewish, certainly tinged with philosophy, but uh, Philo uh, is a uh, huge... Sorry, Jewish. a Jewish Greek philosopher. Absolutely, but a Jew and very learned, right. as was Josephus. So that's a Jewish tradition, and I think it's a right. correct one. Yeah, it's a um, great, great question. Uh, j just one last one, Anthony. Sorry, they're coming in now. No, fine. How could Jesus be a high priest before a blood sacrifice or atonement was made? Well, because um, he is the high priest. That's Hebrews 9.11. He showed up as the high priest. He hadn't died yet. He was ministering the new covenant gospel before he died. He then later died to bring all of that to fruition, if you like. But to say that Jesus did nothing before he died is very false. The beginning of the gospel, I refer again to Hebrews 2, verse 3. The gospel where God spoke through his son. The gospel began when Jesus spoke. That's why the voice from heaven said, listen to my son. This is my son. Listen to him. He didn't say, you don't have to listen until after the crucifixion. That's just wrong. So the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus all happen. And here's a very good verse. John 6, 63 says, the words that I speak to you, Jesus said when he was here, functioning in his ministry the words that i speak to you are spirit some people think there was no spirit till pentecost that is false jesus told the disciples to go out and raise the dead and heal the sick with no spirit of course not yes the event in pentecost is a massive demonstration of where god is at work in the apostles to show the world i'm at work with these miracles in this group that's absolutely true 
But Jesus was filled with spirit from uh, his yeah. mother's womb. Just one last comment, uh, yeah. Nancy. Jesus was not truly a high priest, yeah. but was above the priest since he is the son of God. Yeah. And I would say, actually, I would modify that a little bit, Nancy. I think you're right, but he was not a mosaic high That's priest. Right. That's he's, why he's above all priests now, because right. he's a priest according not to the yeah. orders, commandments from the law of Moses, the yeah. Torah, but because God himself said so. Can you imagine, Anthony? God himself yes. designates you, yep. you know, to be something. And then someone says to, to Sir Anthony, but Sir Anthony, the scripture says that you can't, you cannot do that office. But wait a minute, God himself has appointed me. Well, so if God exactly right. appoints you to an office, yep. Yep. that means something new has come on the scene. Yeah. Well, it says that in, in Hebrews 3.14, since we have a great high priest, there's Jesus, who has passed through the heavens now, Jesus, the Son of God. So if you say that Jesus was not truly high priest, you're simply contradicting the Bible. We don't want to do that. No, he was the high priest from the moment that God had created him in the womb of his mother the moment he opened his mouth, he was functioning as high priest. That's Hebrews 9, 11. Very, very important text. Yeah, um, I think, uh, mm. let's see, do we have time for how many verse? Uh, yeah, we could do six or a little bit for. Let's go down to eight. Could we okay. go down to eight? This is okay. in chapter six. Let's look at um, verse one. Since we have, or since we should leave the elementary teachings, it doesn't actually mean we should forget them, obviously, but we should go on and build into maturity. The situation today is slightly different, I think, than the people to whom Hebrews writer was writing. Today, people don't have the foundation right. They need to go back to the basics and say, where does the gospel begin in Mark 1? They've been so drugged, may I say, so misled by the notion that Jesus didn't do anything till he died. That's just false. You're missing out on the teaching of Jesus. So let's leave. This writer was concerned that they would not, um, they would get stuck in only, only elementary teaching. I'm suggesting today we need the elementary teachings first. We need the foundation right. So the situation is slightly different. So anyway, wherever we are in our Christian walk, we are to press on to maturity. That's not sinlessness. No Christian is without sin totally. Otherwise, Jesus would not have said, uh, forgive us our trespasses. He, uh, he assumes and realizes, and John says the same thing, that Christians do sin, but they shouldn't be sinning on a constant basis, obviously. So we're to press on to maturity, not relaying the foundation all the time. Today, I would argue the situation is rather different. You have to lay the foundation for people here. So it's not a question of relaying. It's a question of laying it properly. And that foundation is repentance. Where does repentance begin? Mark 1, 14 and 15. Repent and believe the gospel of the kingdom. And so they repent and stop not believing the gospel of the kingdom. Why does Jesus talk about the kingdom? Because that's where Adam went wrong. And if you want to reverse the disaster of Adam, you get back to the kingdom of God, where God subjected the whole world to Adam, but he failed miserably. So the answer to that is to believe that God subjected the world to man, he gave the world to man, and man failed. So the answer to that is repent and start believing in the kingdom of God gospel, Mark 1, 14, 15. Okay, and we'll do this if God permits. That's a sort of a nice uh, biblical way of saying, you know, God willing, we'll, we're going to do this, and we should. Okay, in the case, now he, does, he gets very grim. This book is severely a warning book. In the case of those who have once been enlightened, that would be true Christians, have tasted, so to speak, of the gift of the Spirit and have been made partakers of Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I don't need to tell our audience here, 
is not a third person. The Holy Spirit never sends any greetings. The Holy Spirit is never prayed to. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God or Jesus interchangeably in his operational presence working in our lives. If you've tasted of that Spirit of God, same as the good Word of God, Word of God, I repeat, is not just the Bible. The Bible calls itself the Scriptures. The Word of God is the Gospel of the Kingdom, Matthew 13, 19. And you've experienced something of the powers of the future age. I don't think we've experienced the signs and wonders of apostles. I don't think we have. But we've certainly seen miraculous things in our Christian experience. We're, we're not then to fall away. Because, verse 6, if you fall away from that happy condition, it is impossible. Wow. To renew them again to repentance. You can't repent twice in the basic sense. Yes, you can repent often in your life of mistakes you make, but you can't give the basic repentance a second chance. It doesn't work. Since what happens if you fall away, as this writer is warning his friends not to do, you're crucifying Jesus over again, putting him to open shame. You certainly don't want to nail Jesus to the cross, do you? So get real and repent and turn back to God if you have fallen from him. Because then he gives us an agricultural image here, the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls on it and brings forth vegetables is useful, for whose sake it's also tilled and it receives a blessing from God. That's the parable of the sower, the idea of sowing the seed and then producing fruit. But if it yields thorns, again, reference to Jesus' parables, thorns and thistles, it's useless and close to being cursed. And the end of that then is burning up in the lake of fire. This is an awful book. Jesus spoke about the lake of fire. If you don't make progress, you're going backwards. You cannot stand still as a Christian. You either go forward by persistent prayer and study, activity on behalf of the gospel, or you go back. You cannot stand still as a Christian, this writer says. This is not easy stuff, but I recommend it for your meditation. Okay, anything else, Carlos, there? Uh, where did you, sorry, stop? I stopped then at verse 8. If it yields thorns, uh, this will, we, we can go to the end, I think, if you want. Okay. Yeah, yeah we've got, we got a few more verses. But beloved, so he loves those to whom he's writing. My brothers and sisters, we might say, we're convinced of better things. I'm hopeful that you're going to do better. And you're going to do things which will be producing salvation. When you get that word salvation, I remind you, always go back to chapter 2. How shall we escape in chapter 2? I'm referring to it. If we neglect such great salvation, which was first spoken by Jesus. That's in Hebrews 2. You want to have that verse on the refrigerator. Salvation was not first demonstrated by Jesus dying. That's also very important. Salvation begins by the speaking. It had its beginning, Hebrews 2, 3, in the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, not just his death. Okay. And then he's rather more conciliatory to his audience in verse 10. God has not forgotten all the good work you've done and the love which you've shown towards his agenda, his name. Name virtually means his whole religious thing, his whole religion, his own his whole gospel. You've done good work for the gospel. You've been ministering to the saints, and they have. You know, Americans particularly are very generous people. There's a lot of good work that goes on in all sorts of different settings. We desire, in verse 11, that each one of you, brothers and sisters, show the same diligence. The question of being diligent here, <clears throat> not being feeble or not being sloppy. <clears throat> so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. The end is always the second coming. The end of your life might happen before that, in which case that's the end for you personally. But the end in view is always the parousia, 
<clears throat> so it will not be sluggish. Don't be lazy, but imitators of those <clears throat> who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's the goal, to inherit the promises made to Abraham. In fact, he ends <clears throat> with this reference to Abraham, which is really brilliant. Everything goes back to the covenant made with Abraham, not Moses, Abraham. So most of the Bible writers are very conscious of Abraham. When God made his promise, what was that promise? You always in your notes say you would write, <coughs> what is it, Romans 4.13. The promise, Romans 4.13, the promise to Abraham and his seed that he and they would be heirs of the world. That's what the promise to Abraham is. Uh, God made that promise, yes, there it yeah. is. All mm -hmm. right, we'll, we'll yep. stop there, Anthony. Yep. We'll pick it up from 13. So, All right. So there's All right. a lot to digest there with the uh, promise yep. to Abraham. Absolutely. Good, good idea. You'd like to say more on that. So we'll leave yep. it there. Good idea. Thank you. And uh, all right. Thank you. So we'll mm. be back next Sunday uh, for... So let's see, where are we here? I'm marking it down. Hebrews 6.13, we will start. So, all right. Um, we'll wrap it up. And uh, before we do, I'll share some uh, quotes. Uh, not quotes, sorry. Some comments we get during the months on our YouTube channel. And this is top four reasons why God is one person in the Bible from last Sunday. A nice one indeed, the one true God of Israel is one person, the Father. That's from Back to Biblical Faith, our friend there in the UK. Thank you for watching. On the video, what is the Christian gospel as Jesus preached it? Increasingly, as I watch Fox News, other news channels, I'm struck by the fact that everyone, whether on the left, right, center, of the political spectrum are all seeking answers to mankind's problems. We have tried democracy, socialism, communism, monarchies, dictatorships, and the like. Each form of governance having its own inherent failings. I'm convinced that the only long-term solution to the earth's problems is God's coming kingdom under the stewardship of his Messiah, Jesus. When the kingdom does arrive, it will be an awe-inspiring moment and a truly incredible opportunity to live in true peace under its wise counsel. Amen to that. Really like that. Uh, let's see on the last Bible study. Happy belated birthday, Sir Anthony. So Sir Anthony had his birthday last month, the 28th, by the way. Great Truth Bible teachings, Barbara, Sir Anthony, Carlos, amen. Thank you all for all your prayers. They are a comfort to me, and I thank the Lord God and the Lord Christ Jesus for the many blessings and prayers that I continually receive as I'm going through all of my son's things in Jesus' name. And as some of you don't know, Sharon suffered a great tragic loss uh, of her son, and uh, we continue to pray for you, Sharon, and thank you for your steadfast faith and courage under these circumstances. Last uh, one here, and now this is a baptism from Tell, a brother of ours in the UK. He was just baptized, so thank God for that. And uh, welcome, brother, says Terry Robinson, to the life of the age to come. Well in prospect <laughs> where we shall never have health problems and we shall never die amen so that's a good one to end with uh before we go a couple of announcements so there was sorry did you want to say something anthony no that's fine uh, just remind sarah to please put that quote that you just read a moment or so ago make sure that goes in the magazine about the government Everything's about government, and we need the kingdom. Marvelous letter you just read. Yep. Okay.
sorry, I'm on mute. Sorry, I'm back. Thank you, Anthony. Yes, we will get that uh, that message through. There was a debate postponed. It's uh, back on uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday, July 13th at 8 p.m. If you're one of our uh, members of our online church, you can watch it and listen to it and join the chat and, and ask questions on the site you are on right now. And for others, just go to our YouTube page. So are all foods clean? That's the debate specific to foods. As we know, many self-professed Christians believe that the church should still be following. Christians should be following the food laws, Levitical food laws. So I will discuss that with uh, another person from the UK, Josh Jones. So please tune in for that one. <clears throat> All right, and uh, we'll close with prayer now. Um, please uh, keep in your prayers all those families that lost uh, people in that uh, building collapse in Florida. There was a building collapse earlier uh, some weeks ago now, is it three weeks ago, and uh, 100 plus, almost, what was it, almost 200 people died. One fell swoop. So it reminds us of how we are all facing really the kingdom. We're all facing judgment because it might come the next day or the next second. So please pray for all that, those families that, as usual, these tragedies will uh, bring us to repentance and believe in the gospel of Jesus. Father, we thank you for this time, for Sir Anthony, his longevity. We pray for those less fortunate than us around the world, the country still battling this pandemic, Africa, South America. We have many churches there, hundreds of like-minded believers in South America and Peru, headed by Pastor Ed. I pray for uh, Alex in Nicaragua as well. Our, our people in uh, Australia, the Michelsons come to mind, and Greg Dybel and their ministries, their respective uh, congregations and meetings. We thank you for Lori and her great work with the website. We thank you for the youth, uh, the youth uh, lessons, Tracy and my wife, Sarah and Barbara and Michelle. And uh, please keep Michelle and Tom safe during their travels at the moment. We pray for our other church members, the Warrens and Vicky. So, Father, now we ask you to keep us safe. Continue to give us the courage, the wisdom to uh, continue the gospel about the kingdom and the things regarding your son, Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. God bless and until we meet again.